<laughs> Welcome back to another episode of the Sales Gravy Podcast. With me on this episode is Carol Mahoney, who has a brand new book out called Buyers First. Carol and I are going to spend some time talking about how you collaborate with your buyers in order to sell more. Now, before we get started, I want you to go check out Sales Gravy University. Sales Gravy University is where teams and individuals come from around the globe to sell more. Now, this digital learning platform is different than anything that you've ever experienced before. First, we have courses from the top 40 sales experts in the world that you can take at your leisure, over a thousand hours. Plus, we have live courses that are delivered by our master trainers every single week that you can get into live with your peers and you can learn different skill sets that you need in order to close more business. And we also have mastermind groups. And I'm really proud of our mastermind groups because the mastermind groups are places where you can come together with your peers from different industries, different places who are experiencing the same things that you are to get together and solve your biggest sales problems. And right now, if you've never taken a course on SalesGrave University before, you can take your first one for free by using the code free course. That's free course. Just go to learn.salesgravy.com, learn.salesgravy.com. I'm so excited about what we're doing on SalesGrave University. I know you will be too. Carol Mahoney, welcome to the Sales Gravy Podcast. I'm so glad that you're on. It's been a long time since we've had a chance to get together. I think the last time that you and I actually were speaking together live was back in 2019 or 2018 at the Outbound Conference in Atlanta, Georgia. But yeah. you've got this brand new book out called Buyers First, and I've followed your path as you've written this book. As an author, I'm, it's been interesting. So I've, I followed your path on Instagram as you, you were trying to figure out what you were going to write and how you were going to write it and the agonizing process of putting it all together, all the way up to the place where you you were on the front porch of your house when the box came, which is the best day in the world for a buyer, and you opened the box. And I've listened to your podcast with other people, and in, one of them was with Mike Weinberg, my good friend, and it made me super jealous and envious that he had you on. And the, it was just such a brilliant message that I've begged and pleaded you to come on with us. But before we get started into the message itself and talking about how we collaborate with buyers, I really want to hear more about your journey for writing a book. I don't think a lot of people really understand how agonizing writing a book can be. Yeah, I certainly didn't understand how agonizing it would be when I when I came up with the idea that I wanted to write a book 12 plus years ago, which is how long it took me to birth this book. And I often compare writing a book to trying to give birth to a child, trying to get pregnant, uh, and all of the labor pains that go into that. And one of the things that I've learned in writing this book is that I wanted to write a book that was going to transform the way people saw themselves, the way that they saw sales, the way they interacted with their buyers, but I didn't realize how much it would change me in the process of doing that, how much it would transform how I thought about things and how I even looked at myself. And I tried for 12 years to write this book because I kept struggling with what to write it about. What do I say? And with that, of course, came all of the, the need for approval and the imposter syndrome, like who's going to want to hear what I have to say? Uh, who's going to really care? There's the Jeb Blunts of the world who've like written endless books about all kinds of wonderful things. Like, what do I have to possibly contribute to that? And I struggled with it off and on because I really, I said to my husband, I said, this is my, if I get hit by a bus insurance policy, at least people will be able to learn from the mistakes that I've made so that they can maybe avoid some of those potholes in the road. And I think the reason that I struggled with it, I didn't actually realize what it was until I met uh, my writing coach, AJ Harper, who works, uh, has the top three book workshop. And what she said to me is that a book is not about something. A book is for someone. And in that moment, it was a light bulb moment for me because that is exactly what I say to my coaches when uh, coaches, when I'm coaching them, salespeople and managers, that it's not about you and what you sell and your products and your features. It's about your buyer. It's not about you. So I needed to follow my own advice in writing the book. And that's when I started to realize that the book that I wanted to write, the person who I wanted to write it for was who I was 20 years ago when I first started my business, when I realized I had to learn how to sell. And it was my perceptions of sales that prevented me from being able to actually engage with buyers in meaningful ways to do the things that I know that I should do, like prospecting, reaching out to people, but found every excuse of why I shouldn't or couldn't. And that's what got in my way of, you know, being able to be successful with my business early on. And the work that I had to go through in hiring a coach and working through those things I wanted to write the book that didn't exist today. We have so many great sales books about uh, sales techniques and things to do for people in companies. 
But when you look for sales books that are related to the business owner who has to sell themselves, which I would argue is the hardest sales job in the world, there's nothing really out there for them. It's all about marketing and product development. And so I wanted to put into the hands of the business owners who are trying to figure out how to grow their businesses, who have to sell in order to pay the bills. What do you need to do and learn in order to shift your mindsets, your skill sets, and engage with buyers in ways that science says they want to be engaged with? I also was hoping that would help salespeople in companies because you've probably seen this as well. When you go in and you train a company, you train the leaders and managers, and it's like the telephone game where it starts to drip down to the people, but not in the same way it was delivered to the leaders. I wanted to put that in the hands of the people who are engaging with their customers. Uh, and so I've been delighted at the response. I've been delighted at uh, you know all of the things and all of the work that I put into it, that it is actually having the impact that I wanted it to have which as an author, you know, you put in that work because you want to make a positive impact and change in the world. And to get that back is, is the best kind of reward you can get. I think what most people don't understand, especially people who start writing a book, and I think you're probably getting this figured out really quickly with this, is that it's really, really hard to write a book. It's almost mm -hmm. impossible to sell one. And it's because it's, you know, you're, you have to get your message out there. One of the reasons why this book is landing on so, much, so many people's radar, and I think this is an important lesson for salespeople, is that it's your infectious passion for the message itself. It's the way that you are coming across. Like when I watch you talk about this book, and I mean this as a sincere compliment, I want to buy the book because I'm buying you. Like I'm buying the way that, that you talk about it and feel about it. So you can tell that this wasn't just something that you slapped together. You truly did write this for your 20 year old self. And I, it's, some, it's some, I mean, amazing to me that you came to that conclusion because when people ask me like, what, what inspires you to write books? And I'm, you know, I'm on my 16th book now. I'm writing books for myself. And that's what I tell people. I don't write books for anybody else. I write books for me. I write books for when I was 25, 26 years old, what would I wanted to know? When I was 35 years old and I was running a sales team, what would I want to know? And and that that's like, to me, that's how I get so much passion in a book and why I get, I, I'm, I'm attached to my book just like they're all children. And I do talk about that. I, I feel like, and I think I wrote that in one of the, the prefaces of, of, I think I did this in objections that, you know, writing a book is like having a baby. Like it, it is that level of pain. And like a lot of, you know, moms who have multiple kids, after you go through the pain, for some reason or another, I forget that when I was writing the book, I'm said never, ever again. It's uh it's a, it's an excruciating process. I mean, I don't know how it was. I know that you, I, I watched the, you know, all your Instagram posts with you and your husband and the things that you guys would do that are pretty fun. But we were at a party just recently and one of our friends asked my wife about the next book I was writing and my wife just deadpanned and said, you're probably going to need to ask his next wife because, you know, the, my, you know, the world falls apart when you're writing the book. And then when you're promoting the book, it's like everything stops. I, I don't know if, if you've had that experience where it's like, I'm just sorry, I got to write now. Yeah, you no, know, totally. And so like nights and weekends, uh, even on vacations when we would go to Florida for the winter, um, he's sitting by the pool and writing. And and my husband is so good. He's so supportive. Like he knows I'm sitting down here and writing and I will probably forget to eat when I'm in that yeah. flow of things. So he'll come downstairs and put just coffee and breakfast in front of me because he knows like he doesn't even interrupt me or anything like that. So he's really good about that. And he's so gracious too about really he's my muse like a lot of the stories that I have in the book Steve is in those stories and so he's like every time he does something and I like you know I get that look in my he's like is that going in the book is that going in your next blog article I'm like yes honey sorry <laughs> love it well as I read the book and I started thinking about the content in the book what it what occurred to me if I could if I could wrap this in and I, and I hate when you know people wrap a book in a bow but if I wrap this in a book in a bow this book, Buyers First, is really about, if we think about it, selling from a place of relaxed confidence. Like It's not about trying to push the sale forward. We have to advance the sale. I mean, this, there's no doubt that there's a sales process. But as I read this and I think about the way that I sell as a business owner when I'm working with people, it truly is collaborative. I had a, a, a sales call just recently where – I said, these are the different options that are out there and let's put these things together. Let's work together and create the right package for your business that makes sense for you. And yeah. you could have just, you know, like you could watch the people on the other end who just, they just relaxed and they said, okay, let's put this thing together. It's like, tell me what you want. So 
it's it's a different way of looking at the world. If you can come into the selling motion at a relaxed state, you have a tendency to be so much better and you really do become, you know, we've been talking about consultative selling for 40 years, but I mean, you really do at that point become a consultant because as a consultant, that's where I am. And, and I give you an example of this as I was on Wednesday with a client of mine, they're working on a new compensation program for their sales team. And I literally traveled, I did eight hours of travel for a 90 minute meeting with their, with their, their finance team to walk them through the, the, the different components of the compensation plan, work out the math. And there's a, there's a controller, a financial, you know, director in there who's poking holes in all the numbers. And I started like, as, as, you know, started thinking as a, you know, as an executive, well, I need to defend this. And then I started thinking as a consultant, no, I don't, this isn't my stuff. This is their stuff. I'm just, I'm just helping them come to the conclusion. So I said, you know, these are your numbers, not my numbers. I'm just giving you a framework. Why don't you start plugging the numbers that make you feel more comfortable? And all of a sudden, everybody in the room just went, like all of the tension went out because it wasn't like I'm selling you on anything. I'm helping you come to a conclusion that, that you know that you need to make a change. How you're going to make the change is really up to you, not up to me. Yeah. Let's talk a little yeah. bit about that. Well, and it's such a small, subtle shift, right? That it's almost imperceivable to some people who, who, who don't know what's going on. But I work with so many young, you know, BDRs, SDRs, and AEs. I actually had one, uh, well, I was at a meeting on Thursday night and there was a VDR who was there and he came up to me and he's like, so when you're, when you're looking at, you know, VDRs and, and, and advising on how to advance to an AE, what are the things that make up, you know, the best skills, the best thing that I can do as a salesperson that's going to help me advance in my career? And I said, there's two things that you need to know. One is that you need to be able to actively listen to your buyers because that's what's going to do that calm and cool confidence, active listening, being in the present moment, being in control and regulating your emotions. That's what's going to allow you to see tone, the, bo the body language, what's going on with your buyers to get a real keen sense of what's important to them. I said, and the other thing is the ability to ask open-ended sequential questions, which is what I call collaborative questions because it invites the other person to then be able to offer more information. And so it's these two small, subtle shifts that happen, but is also the biggest challenge for salespeople today. Like the reason that they're so anxious is, you know, their manager is bringing pressure on them to meet their quotas, or they're a business owner who's trying to pay their bills. And we get so wrapped up in the things that we need in this conversation, how we need to move this forward and what we need to do when we're making it all about ourselves. And that's what's causing the tension in the sales conversations with buyers, which prevents us from being collaborative. We think that we need to persuade them, influence them, motivate them, sell them on this thing. But what the reality is, is that we put value on things that we've had a say in, a collaborative effort in. And when someone creates something for us, it creates anxiety because what if they don't get it right? What if they don't understand these particular aspects? They don't know all of these pieces of it that we need to know. And so that's how I kind of look at this collaborative in, you know, part of sales is really that's how we solve all problems is it's not about I have the best ideas and you need to listen to me. It's about let's figure this out together. Our job as sellers is not to sell to people, it's to sell with them. It's to help them buy things that are in their best interest. And if it's not in their best interest, it's our ethical responsibility to say, this isn't the right fit for you. This, even though it's my product and I'm trying to sell it to you, it's not going to get you to where you want to be. And that's how you're going to then build trust with those buyers. There's a a story in the book that I started with when I was struggling in my business, looking for a job, got an interview with my sister's boss. And at the point where he asked me, who should I hire? And I said, hire the other person because they're a better fit. That's when he said, I'm going to introduce you to everybody I know that needs your help. And that's what you can do as a salesperson as well in a company. Um, and so that's how I see that collaborative effort is it's doing what's in the best interest of yeah. the other person. There's, there's, there's something that's surprising about the, uh, the ability to walk away and say it's not a good fit. Like people, when I wrote Sales EQ, people get me sometimes and say, well, aren't these things that you write about, all the psychology, isn't that manipulative? And I say, well, if I was the CIA and I'm trying to use this, these tools to convince someone to betray their country, yeah, it would be manipulative. But these, sa these same psychological tools, the way, like you described this, this is how people operate. This is how people want to buy, how people want to discover things. It's how people come to conclusions about the fact that their current situation is untenable and they need to change. 
it's not manipulative if you're working in the buyer's best interest. If you're willing to say, look, I don't think this is the right thing for you. And there's there's surprising confidence that comes in that. And I've, a great example right now is a, I've got a, a couple of clients or prospects that I've had meetings with. And I've, I've gone through a collaborative process. We've gone through deep discovery. We've listened to them. And I've gone back to them and said, you know, I'm not the right fit for you. Our company, what we do and what you're trying to accomplish, these two things aren't going aren't gonna to work. And you're going to end up being disappointed and we're going to end up being disappointed. There's probably a better solution for you. Those clients or prospects are chasing me down now. They're calling. They're, they're trying to sell me on why I need to take them. It's a very right. interesting thing that happens. And that is, that's, you know, the way of saying it, in, and I think this is true inside of a sales conversation and, and outside of a sales conversation, is that human beings have a funny way of running from people who chase them. And I think that's what happens to salespeople when they forget what you said, this subtle nuance of asking questions and, and being in a conversation versus pitching. And I want to I want to get your opinion on this because I, I believe in my heart that eighty percent of the sales process. So when we define the sales process, is in discovery eighty percent, and that most deals are closed in discovery. That yes. that buyers make a decision to do business with you there. That doesn't mean that they sign on the dotted line and they haven't made some you know explicit des, des, desire to close or you know explicit what do you call it commitment to to, uh, to buy from you, but implicitly they're making that commitment because yeah. they're talking through the issues themselves. Yeah. And the key, like the art of true discovery is it's organic. Like you're asking these big open-ended questions and getting out of the way and letting people talk. And I want to, I want to dive into why salespeople have such a hard time with this. And I'm going to load, like, I'm going to lay this up with a story of my own. So one of the things that I'm constantly on the lookout for with my own team is because we have a way that we sell and a way that we teach, and I want people walking the talk, is when my salespeople start getting too transactional. In other words, there's a prospect, especially an inbound prospect, and then they go, bam, 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 want to buy. And I'm always focusing on doing deeper discovery. So a couple of weeks ago, got my team together, and I did a discovery call to demonstrate how this is done. And this is the only question that I asked. Tell me what's going on. Yeah. And I just shut up. My my prospects, the two people on the on the call, talked for 45 minutes. Mm-hmm. 30 minutes of that call, they were talking to themselves in circles. Like they were they were going around and around and around. None of it really made any sense. They were having a hard time dialing it in. The last 15 minutes were absolute gold. Like they figured mm-hmm. out how to to describe their situation in a more linear fashion. And all I did after they got done talking for 45 minutes is I told their story back to them with a handful of value bridges to specific things that we could do to help them with their current situation. And they yes. all went, that's the greatest thing ever. That's perfect. And, and the, in fact, the director of sales told the VP of sales, get the checkbook out. We need this. Uh-huh. And when I got off, you know, I'm looking at my people and I'm like, that's how you do it. And they're like, that was, that was amazing. Like, how do you do that? You said this is like this is nuance. Like I asked one freaking question and shut up. That's how I did it. Explain yeah. to me why people have such a hard time doing it. And I will tell you that's like so much of my practice is teaching people how to ask good open-ended questions, OEQs, and then shut up. Let's talk about yeah. that. Well, and it's interesting because there's a dynamic that's happening on both sides of the table. So uh, there's. Um, I, I, I dug into a lot of the both psychological research on this, but then I also dug into some of the neuroscience behind this. And what I found is there was a study that was done at Stanford and also a study that was done at Harvard. And when I put these two things together, it was another one of those light bulb moments for me because I wanted to understand this exact dynamic. Why is it this? Why is this happening? How is this happening? And so the thing that happens, you were talking about your prospects who were talking for 40 minutes around in circles and round in circles. Well, what's happening is, is that when we talk about the things that we think, that we want, that we have a perspective and opinion on, what's happening is, is that we're getting these dopamine hits in our brain, right? Because who doesn't love to talk about themselves? Most of us do. And so what happens is that we get these dopamine hits in our brain, which we all know, like when we look at our cell phones and we're on social media, that can be addicting. And so we want to keep doing more of that. We're getting all of these pleasure chemicals that are flooding our brains. 
The other thing that's happening in our brains when we're asked, answering these kinds of questions and we're offering this kind of information is that the part of our brain where this dopamine is coming from is the part of our brain where we form bonds, relationships, and attachments, right? Like if, if you can go back to when you first started dating your wife, same idea, ask a question about them, let them start talking about themselves, and suddenly you've started to build a relationship and a bond. Now, the reason that it's so hard for salespeople to shut up is this exact same thing. Because when we're talking up to the buyer about what we think and what we think that they should do, that same dopamine is flooding our brains. And so we have to resist the urge to talk ourselves so that our buyers can get those dopamine hits. And again, it comes back to that being able to regulate your emotions. Oftentimes what I see happen is that Sellers will go into discovery conversations, and I often say that the sale the sale close starts the moment you say hello. Um, the other sort of interesting fact of this is I leverage over two million uh, data points from over two million salespeople, and when we look at the data, we find that most salespeople, less than five percent of salespeople out there, are have good closing skills. So how is it that they're able to actually close anything? They're really good at everything else before that in discovery. And so the thing that I often find is that when we're getting stuck in these places where we're doing all of the talking, it's because we're getting these buying signals from our buyers. They show a little bit of interest. Suddenly we get all excited and we start talking about how they should buy these things because they started to show interest. Or we're getting all of this talking in because our sales manager is telling us that we need to be doing all of these things and giving this value proposition. And so all of the things, the emotional stress that happens causes us to just start pitching and word vomiting all over our buyers. So that's why it's so hard is because of the dopamine that's happening in our brains. But now that we know this as salespeople, if we can just shut up <laughs> and ask those open-ended questions and know when to, it's almost like when your buyers are going through that diatribe of what they're saying, your job is almost just to kind of set a little bit of bumpers around to kind of help guide them down deeper paths to really uncover succinct things that they're saying there. And instead of, you know, trying to show how smart you are or showing, you know, how much you know about their business and their product and, and essentially just doing all of the talking. Yeah. Folks, what, what Carol's talking about is something called the self-disclosure loop. And this was, demonstrated we've known this i mean aristotle knew this we understood that if we can get people talking and get out of the way people will continue talking back in 2014 harvard did a study it was it was uh, published in the american journal of science it was in the wall street journal it was in the harvard business review where a group of scientists put people into these 3d mris and they took a picture of their brain while they were bragging or talking about themselves and what they were able to see is that as a person began to talk about themselves, blood would begin to rush into the pleasure centers of the brain, the part of the brain that creates bonds, makes us feel good. And then as they would continue to self-reveal, what they could see was that those pleasure centers of the brain on these three-day MRIs were lighting up like a Christmas tree. That was the dopamine hit that Carol's talking about. I call it brain crack. Like they're literally getting a drug. And yeah. if you can stay out of the way, and the way you do this is actively listening. In other words, you're giving tangible evidence that you're paying attention to them. Like you're, what, what Carol's doing to me right now on camera, if you're watching this, you can't see if you're listening, but she's nodding her head. When you do that and you smile, it rewards people for talking. And if you let them keep talking, right, if you continue to let them keep talking, they'll keep talking. And the key here is... You, you said this, the nuance of paying attention to their body language. And this doesn't mean you need to go to a body language course. This means that you need to use your human intuition to see that whatever they just said was emotionally important to them. And your follow-on questions need to be organically focused around those emotional areas where you say, hey, that seems like it's important to you. Tell me more about that. And then shut up. And the most important thing that you can do to keep perpetuating the self-disclosure loop, like tell me what's important to you, just shut up, let them go, is that when they stop talking, pause. Anthony Anarino talks about this all the time. Like, count to yourself, one, two, three, because here's what's beautiful. When you pause, they're formulating their thought, they're thinking about what they're going to say, they're going to fill in that silence, and almost always what comes after that is what they really think, what they really mean, what's really important to them. And Carol, I want to mm -hmm. walk you through four core principles of effective sales conversations. We start thinking about it from this standpoint. My job is to get you to reveal 
what's below the surface. And one of the things that you say in the book early on is when you first started, your first questions are about status quo. Like what's the real state of the situation? And what we know, because we see this all the time with buyers, is that buyers have a tendency to hide what's really happening. So they're telling you everything's sunny on the surface, but the things that are really important are below the surface. If you don't give them time to get comfortable telling you what's below the surface, they won't. That's why we talk about the self-disclosure loop. So yeah. if we think about when we start a conversation, and I, I want to pack this into something because you've just nailed it, but I want, I want the audience to sort of, let's think about this as a more of a framework, is that people have a tendency to respond in kind. So we want to begin with confidence, relaxed confidence. We're transferring that emotion to our buyer. We're relaxing them, we're relaxed. Tell me what's going on. Pretty simple, right? We also understand that questions control the conversation flow. So one of the reasons why salespeople talk is because they believe that by their mouth running, they're in control. And the truth is, is the person asking the questions is in control. So we can ask any question we want. Like, that sounds really important to me. Tell me more about that. I can move the conversation anywhere I want to go. Third principle is that people communicate in stories. And this is important. In my situation, my buyer is spending 45 minutes, 30 minutes of that is just nonsense, but it's their story. They're communicating in a, in a nonlinear fashion the way you communicate, I communicate. And the problem for salespeople is we want it to be simple. And, and you said, we're get, it's us too. Like when we're not talking, we don't feel good because we're not getting the same brain crack. So what we do is talk over the buyer, cutting off the self-disclosure loop, so that we can feel good. In other words, people communicate in stories, but it would be so much better for us if they would communicate in bullet points and just tell us exactly what they want. And, and so we have to learn to stay out of the way and let them tell the story. And you said this, and I want to nail this down. Fourth principle is that when you listen, it creates deep emotional connections. When you're listening to someone, you're making them feel important. The need for significance is the most insatiable human need. And when you truly listen to someone, you give them the greatest gift that you can give another human being. And when you give someone a gift, they feel the need to reciprocate. And that is how you move them to the next step in your sales process without having to close the deal. When I think about this, and I think about my entire career in selling, I'm not a great closer but I know that the deal is often closed in discovery. So it's not about I get to a point where I go sign here. There are some deals, you know, transactional deals that are like that. But when I'm talking about bigger deals, they're closing themselves. I mean, they're telling me like this, this, this makes sense to me. Let's go do this. Or, hey, I like that. Or when can we get started? So yeah. if you think about that, that's easy. Like that's simple. We understand the psychology of our need to, to talk. Like it makes us feel good. And, and everything that Carol described is right on the money. But this is what's so amazing. Like the, the, the ability to be better in sales is at your fingertips right now. It's called mouth shut, eyes, ears open, right? Listen with your eyes, listen with your ears, listen with your heart. If you do those things, you're going to be better. So Carol, walk me through like when you're coaching people, it's, you know, mm -hmm. and, 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 you know, especially think about your business owners or your, you know, your people that you're trying to teach, you know, young salespeople, and you're coaching them to build better listening skills. Cause that's really what we're talking about. Cause you're never going to collaborate with your buyer if you're not listening and you're never going to put your buyer first. If you're not listening, I, I think that that's fair to say, Absolutely. teach us, how can we do this? Like, what can we do? Because on one hand, this is simple. It's surprising that people pay us for this. It's simple, right? But it seems like it's the most difficult thing in the world for people to do. Yes, we're fighting against neuroscience and we're fighting against our own bodies and minds in the process. But teach me how and teach our audience, how do you become a better listener? And how do you learn how to ask open-ended questions instead of these, these closed-ended leading questions that salespeople often ask? Yeah. So when I'm working with uh, sales teams, salespeople, sales managers, and business owners, uh, the process we go through is what I call a cognitive behavioral approach to sales performance. And so it's not just about teaching them what to do, because a lot of us know we should be asking better questions. We know we should be actively listening, just like we know we should be eating vegetables and fruits and exercising in order to be healthy. But how, how big is the weight loss industry? Because we don't do the things that we know that we should do, right? As simple as they are. And so when I'm working with these people, one of the things that I first do 
is I want them to identify what are their personal goals? What are what's meaningful to them in this change that they're about to go through? Because change is hard. It's risky. It's, it's hard and risky for our buyers. And so it is also for us to change some of these deep rooted tendencies that we have as human beings. So that's the very first step. And the reason that that's important is not just to get an understanding of what their motivation is to go through this change, but by identifying their own personal value system as well, it helps them with that calm, cool confidence because now their approval, their status is not attached to how good they are as a salesperson or what their buyer does. It's something that is completely separate from that. And then the other thing when an active listening is hard for almost everybody. And so the thing of this is, and this is what I often tell them, is that sales is life. Everything that you do in life is a sales conversation, which means it's really just about being a good communicator. And the other thing about this is that, you know, it takes on average between 30 and 40 repetitions of a particular habit before it starts to become second nature to us. And so the challenge that I have in coaching is that it's really hard to get 30 or 40 repetitions of a particular thing in. And so what I tell my coachees is that I want you to practice on everybody around you, your grocery store clerk, your Uber driver, the waiter at the restaurant, the person standing in next in line to you, just start asking open-ended questions. How is your day going? You know, what, you know, anything like that. And then practice those active listening skills. And sometimes it's as simple as repeating back to them what you heard them say and then asking another open-ended question for them to continue to dig deeper. Oh, traffic was really hard today. What are some of the things that you do in order to keep yourself entertained when you're facing traffic problems? Because as you start to build that habit and active listening and repeating back what you heard, asking the next open-ended question, you know, holding back what you think it is that you want to say, then when you get into your sales conversations, you're not practicing that on your prospects anymore. It's starting to become second nature to you. And the other thing that I often find when I'm working with my coaches is that they'll come back to me months and years later and say, my personal relationships have changed closer with my family, my friends. I just got engaged. I've been single for way too long. It's like dating advice for them. Yes. And, and so we can, this is, Sales is not some separate thing that we do in our lives. It's a part of everything that we do. We are all salespeople, whether you're a parent trying to convince your kid to eat their vegetables or the kid trying to convince your parents to let you, you know, get something at the store, the employee who's asking for resources, we are all in a sales conversation at any given time. So let's practice in an intentional and deliberate way how to have, be better active listeners and ask open-ended questions on everyone around us. So freaking My powerful. That's what I explain to people. Like they ask me, how do you become a better listener? I go, look, I'm a terrible listener. I'm an outcome driven person. I'm self centric. I, I, I'm, I'm, you know, because some people are, are super empathic. Like my wife is super empathic. Like she can listen to anybody. People will tell her anything. I'm not that way. Like I'm, I'm thinking about me most all the time. And that's, that's who I am. So the way that I become a better listener is exactly what you said. It's so funny you said that because my best advice for people is the next time you get into an Uber, and there's somebody driving the car that doesn't make a, a difference to you in the world, ask them how their day's going and shut up. Don't talk yeah. about you. Ask about them. Do a follow-up question. Even though what whatever they're saying is making your brain hurt, practice doing that. And that's what I do regularly to make sure that when I get into the game with the prospect where it does matter, that I know how to listen better. Yeah. I think there's also an aspect of developing your natural curiosity. There's something that happens when we go through adulthood that we lose that childlike curiosity about things. Like we suddenly think that we have all of it figured out. And, you know, and a lot of times when I'm working with uh, my sellers, a lot of times the thing that's getting in their way of being able to actively listen is their own emotional involvement in the conversation. And so one of the ways that I also help them to get through that is in their everyday lives, I want you to find a way to play. Because when you're doing play, when you're doing improv, where there's no rules and restrictions, suddenly it's not about what people think of me anymore and what am I going to do next. You don't have a choice but to be in the present moment and act out of curiosity. So the more ways that you can find ways to play, I, I shared a story of um, I started going back to horseback riding because I hadn't done it in 20 years and my son was taking lessons and I'm like, okay, well, this is something I can do again. And I forgot what it was like to try and stand and trot and, you know, jumping over things and how much, how sore it was. And, you know, I was so worried about like, how is my, my son's going to think I'm horrible at this and I've done it before. And at one point I was like, whatever. And I'm just laughing and bouncing around everywhere, thankfully not falling off of the horse. But it reminded me of when we're at play, we're not worried about what everything else is thinking, whatever, whatever is going on around us. And so that's another way to kind of deal with 
that emotional involvement that gets us out of the present moment and stops us from actually listening to our buyers. And Carol, you might not know this, but there's tons of military recruiters who listen to this podcast and military recruiters are out in a world where it's harder and harder to find qualified prospects. So mm -hmm. for military recruiters, I want you to listen to what Carol is teaching you and pay attention to this because in a world where you have fewer people that you can engage, you have to win every conversation. In other words, every single conversation counts. So in those conversations, we have a habit to talk about ourselves, to tell our own military story, or to go in and transact the conversation. What we're trying to do is get someone emotionally connected to us because people are going to join you and then they're going to join the military, just like your buyer is going to buy you and then they're going to buy your product or service. And just how simple this is, if you can get into a conversation and ask those open-ended questions and be relaxed and, and give the conversation time to percolate, you create those emotional connections and then you have the ability to collaborate with your candidate. And if you're selling, collaborate with your buyer on coming up with a solution that matches their unique situation. And really, you don't have to think about anything else. Nothing else matters except for what matters to them. And this is a, a maybe a good segue into this concept of the the buyer first. It's not about us. It's about them. And you say this over and over and over again in this book. In fact, you've got a couple of, of, of call outs. Say it to yourself. Say it out loud. It's not about me. Right. Yes. So uh, so let's I want to set this up with something I said earlier. I'm outcome driven. Yeah. If, if you look at at studies and there's several uh, several dissertations there's some some studies in universities around this and we look at pure statistics. Pure statistics would tell us that human beings that are more outcome driven, sales professionals that are more outcome driven, have a higher percentage of closing deals than people who are more empathic. Mm -hmm. Except and until, right, you move into larger deals. So if you take all sales, which most sales are small, not big. So if you take small sales, like I'm, you know, I've got you on the phone and I'm, it's a one call close. The, the, the more transactional I am and moving you to that close, the more likely I'm going to close the deal. So I do need to listen. I do need to build the, 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 uh, the relationship. We're going to do this at a much, at a much smaller scale, right? So we're, we're going to do this all in about 30 minutes versus over, say, six months. But being more outcome driven, asking for the deal really matters in those situations. But as I move up market, as I'm working on larger deals with longer sales cycles, empathy becomes a meta skill. Like the ability to step into the buyer's shoes. It's not about me. It's about them. And and when we look at it from that standpoint, if we start looking at deals that are, say, you know, 90-day sales cycle, so, you know, mid-cycle mid to long-cycle deals, the salesperson who becomes a consultant for the buyer, the salesperson who can step into the buyer's shoes has a much higher win probability than the, 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 buy, the seller that's all about themselves. So, if you look at me, the awareness of I'm look, I'm a self-centric human being. I get that. I understand that. So I have to be super intentional about empathy, seeing yes. things from the buyer's point of view, stepping into the buyer's shoes, making it about them, not me. That's an intentional decision that I make. Talk to me a little bit about that. So and and I, I agree. Like there's there's parts of the sales conversation, depending on the type of sale that you have and depending on the buyer and what's going on, those degrees of empathy. And this is also one of the things that I find my my salespeople and my coaches struggle with is that balance between how do I actually move things forward, but also, you know, making sure that I'm having empathy for that particular person. Um, and actually it was at the outbound conference that I came to this realization with prospecting, for example, right? Like so many people have call reluctance. They don't want to call and interrupt people. But in some industries like manufacturing, for example, they're not going to be on LinkedIn for you to be able to reach them. You have no other way you're going to get them unless you pick up the damn phone. Yes. And so when I get salespeople that come to me and they're like, I don't want to interrupt people. I don't want to call them. I said, look, are you the kind of person who's going to walk down the street, see someone who's holding a million different things in their hand, dropping them all over the place, falls down, breaks their ankle. Are you the person who's going to just wait until they raise their hand for help? Or are you going to drop what you're doing, go over there and give them help, whether they want it or not, whether they've asked for it or not? 
And so that's how I look at that balance between moving things forward and empathy is, is it's really about the perception that you have on the activity that you're about to take. If you look at prospecting as interrupting people, disrupting people, annoying people, then that's how you're going to do the activity. But if you look at it as I am trying to help people who maybe don't realize that they need help yet or don't know that help is actually out there for this particular thing, there is someone out there that needs it. If I have to go through 100 people to find that one person, it makes it all worthwhile. And same thing when you're moving through the actual conversation itself. You know, we talked about active listening and re repeating back what it is that you heard. But there's another piece to that, which is that buyers value conversations that make them think differently about something. And so it's not enough to get them talking. You also have to offer those pieces of information that they might not have fully considered or that they don't know. Because the reality is, is most of the time as a salesperson, especially in complex buying situations, you're talking with hundreds of people in any given week that are facing these same challenges. You have a team of experts behind you in this one particular thing. And so you should be able to offer some insights into someone who is just coming across this, in, this issue, this challenge, trying to figure out how they're going to deal with it in their organization. So summarizing what you heard, but then offering insights. You know, a lot of people in this situation don't realize that this is an obstacle to face. When you come up against that in this change you're trying to enact, how will we go about solving or working through that particular obstacle? And so adding an insight into something is another way that you can start building that empathy with them because then they're like, not only do they get me, they also are looking out for me because of these other things that they've brought up that I probably would have turned around and bit me in the rear if I didn't know about it at this particular point. And so empathy isn't just about understanding and feeling where they're at, but it's also about understanding and seeing where they need to get to and what's going to get in their way of doing that. I love the way that you 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 uh, leverage that insight. That uh, you you leverage it in the form of a micro story. And uh, and folks, if you want to learn more about micro stories, go check out Salesgrave University because we've got a beautiful workshop on micro stories and how you can leverage insights and social proof in in your sales conversations to connect with people, build credibility, but stay focused on the things that are important to them. That was mm -hmm. powerful. That that analogy about helping people might be the best thing I've ever heard. Like that was so freaking good. I hope everybody will go back, play that again and listen to it because that is exactly it. You know, that's it. Are you going to wait for people to ask for help? Or are you going to go out and help them? I mean, that's right. the difference. And that is for the people who are high on the empathy scale, who, you know, that's typically what we do. You have to be an intentional about, about going out and being outcome driven. Let me go help you do something. And, uh, and, and in the middle of your sales conversation, thinking about, if you're going to help them, focus your time and attention on the things they need help with, not the things that, uh, you, know, that you know, like your kitchen sink of, of products and services. There's something that's been bothering me, and I want to slay this dragon. And that right. is that, um, that there are these businesses out there, and I'm, I'm going to be nice about this, but they make a living by creating worthless studies that are like BuzzFeed worthy studies that tell you that these awful things and then everybody gets it. And I get what they're doing. Their business model is data and they use these things as, as lead ends. But one of the, these, um, these studies has been, you know, running around and this, this gets republished about, you know, every other year is that buyers don't want to talk to salespeople anymore. They don't mm -hmm. want to talk to anybody. So buyers want to buy or 2.0 or buyer 3.0 wants to do all the work themselves. I, I'm incredulous over this because every day I'm working with people who need my help. So right. talk to me a little bit about this, these, these, uh, maybe you have a different perspective for, for me. They're just worthless, worthless, stupid statistics that confirm their, their confirmation bias for the salespeople who actually don't want to go help people. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, I also, uh, it, it's a bee in my bonnet, so to speak as well, because it drives me insane because what happens is that these companies, you know, maybe they're citing uh, Gartner or Forrester or something like that. I'll, I'm going to use Gartner as an example, love Gartner research because they don't just tell you one side of the story. They don't just say 50% of, of uh, millennials don't want to talk to salespeople. They add the context to that, which says they don't want to talk to salespeople that are pitch doctors. They're just yeah. going to be throwing yeah. things at you. They want conversations with salespeople earlier in the process that are actually offering those values and those insights that we just talked about. Can, can I stop you there? And, and I just yeah. want to, I want to make a 
a statement. I'm going to let you keep going. Don't stop, okay? Nobody wants to talk to salespeople. You don't exactly. want to talk to salespeople. I don't want to talk to salespeople. I mean, exactly. I don't even like salespeople, and I train. I'm just kidding. But I, I don't want to talk to salespeople until I need to talk to a salesperson. And and sometimes I don't know that I need to talk to a salesperson. And I really like tell, talking to salespeople like Brody from um, Superside, who I was talking to yesterday. And Brody, if you're listening to this, I love you, man. You are an amazing salesperson. Like I'm talking to a real sales professional who is spending time with me, helping me solve a problem. Like I need that help. I'm the reason I'm talking to Brody is I can't make the decision on my own. I need a professional to walk me through the process. All right, keep going. I'm sorry, but I just want to make that point that like, if you say that people don't want to talk to salespeople, nobody wants to talk to salespeople. Nobody likes a cold call. Yeah. Nobody wants to be interrupted, but if you don't interrupt them, they're breaking their ankle on the sidewalk. Sorry, Carol, exactly. go ahead. I'm on my, on my soapbox. That's okay. We, it's a big enough soapbox for both of us. And so here's the thing of this, is that if you really want to look at those studies, so I'm going to use the Gartner study as another example. The other side of that is that salespeople, people want to talk to salespeople in the moments that they need them, but they also want to talk to those that are going to listen to them, that are going to add value into the conversation. So the study shows that. This is the thing that really ticks me off that nobody seems to realize, is that the study also showed is that those who didn't talk to salespeople and made the purchase had a 23% higher purchase regret. In other words, they're going to churn. They regretted their decision. We need salespeople that are going to add value to the conversation. Nobody wants to talk to the pushy, slimy, used car salesman sales anymore. And, and that part of it is going to become obsolete. I, I can make the argument that they never wanted to talk. I mean, they no. didn't ever want to talk to someone who was shoving a solution down their throat. They didn't want to do that in 1920, and they don't want to do it in, in 2024. I mean, so this exactly. is like this. I mean, I don't want to have a conversation in a party with someone who's just telling me about themselves. I mean, the most unlikable human being in your life is the person who is standing in front of you talking about all of their stuff. Themselves. Exactly. Yes. No one would be around the person who's always talking about themselves, not at the cocktail party, not in the sales conversation. The other thing of this, and, and I, I, hopefully the soapbox doesn't get bigger after I say this, now, before it was the social selling dynamic. Social selling is going to replace all salespeople. No more cold calling. Yeah, okay, how's that working out for you? Yeah. Now it's AI. AI is going to replace salespeople. We're going to automate all of these particular types of things. But you said it just a minute ago. I want someone to help me make the right decision. I want someone to confirm to me that I'm thinking the right way and I'm making the right decision and I'm sorry, but a robot, robot cannot make that human connection possible, which is why these soft skills we're talking about, empathy, active listening, this is how you are going to separate yourself from all of the AI bots that are out there. If you can't make a human connection and if you can't add more value in a conversation than Google or Bing does, then you are obsolete yep. and they're not yep. going to listen to you and you might as well Go find some other job. And this is why salespeople are more important than ever. In the age of AI, the human yes. to human connection, to be able to have conversations just like you and I are having right now, it is more valuable, more important than ever before. This is why salespeople who can do exactly what you said, who can put the buyer first, that was a gratuitous book plug, um, <laughs> that can put the buyer first, those salespeople are going to own the future. And yes. Anthony, Anthony and Reno and I right now are writing a book called The AI Edge that we are trying to get out the door. It's a hard, hard book to write. But that book is all about how can you use tech to give you more time to spend with people? Like, that's the whole point. It's not going to replace you. And there, I mean, you know, if it, if it ever does, we're all dead anyway. So AI is going to eat us. Well, <laughs> or wipe us out in some way. I look at AI as a tool to help enhance the human connection. Yes. If they can find research that's going to help me to really relate to someone, uh, it, that's how I use AI, is to make those mundane tasks that I need to do in the sales process more efficient so that I can spend more time with the human. Spend more time with the human. Carol Mahoney, you're an amazing guest. Mike Weinberg, suck it. This was better than your podcast. <laughs> <laughs> and, um, and folks, you got to go get this book. It's called uh, Buyers First. Uh, you can get it on Amazon. You can get it on Barnes & Noble. You can get it on audio. You can get it on, on ebook. You can get it anywhere that books are sold. Go get the book. It will make you a better salesperson. It will help you sell more. Carol, tell people how they can find you. 
So you can go to either one of my websites. Unboundgrowth.com is my corporate training website. CarolMahoney.com is where the book is. All of the resources are there. And I'll just add for anyone who buys the book, there's going to be a monthly free group coaching session that I do for everyone who's bought the book that wants to come in and needs a little bit of help of how do I apply these concepts in my next sales conversation? Because the most important thing for me is that you actually can take action with this. If this is not some theoretical conversation, I want you to go out and start practicing it like right now. That's a hell of a gift. <laughs> that's amazing. <laughs> a group coaching session. Wow. That's fantastic. Carol, thank you so much for joining me on the sales gravy podcast and folks, What I want you to do is go check out Sales Gravy University. I mean this. It is the most powerful sales training engine on earth. You've never experienced anything like it. And right now, you and your entire team, if you've never taken a a course on Sales Gravy before, go use the code FREECOURSE at learn.salesgravy.com. That's learn.salesgravy.com. We'll see you next time on the Sales Gravy Podcast.